today you're going to hear from industry data leaders, including Robert Schoenfeld, the technical partner manager at Click, Eric Tressler, the SVP of Cloud Partnerships at Equifax, Catherine Toll, the director of customer experience at Growth Loop, and James McGeehan, the head of banking and capital markets at Snowflake. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about technology today, but mostly we're going to talk about Troy's vision and the outcomes he is seeing at Renaissance Bank. To set the stage, Renaissance data estate modernization has been empowered by Data Rocket, Passerelle's modern data stack built on Talent and Snowflake that creates a well governed data cloud ready for enrichment and activation by Equifax and Growth Loop, and introduces data observability and governance at every stage of the data lifecycle with pre, pre built dashboards and accelerators. That's the biggest technology pitch you're going to hear today. And I'm going to hand it off now to Bruce to get started on our conversation. Thanks, Carolyn. And welcome, everybody. I'm Bruce, the sales director here at Passerelle. And I'm very excited to kick this webinar off with Troy. Uh, Troy, I've known you for a few years now. And I just wanted to put out there that I feel you've done a superior job at uh, laying out a vision, uh, a smart vision on how Renaissance Bank can use data to support its goals. You've been able to work well across the business lines at Renaissance to, to basically form a team, to take advantage of data for institutional benefit, and you've executed. Uh, and I, I'd love to kick this off with one question. You know, can you describe the initiative that involves Passerelle, Snowflake, Talent, Equifax, and Growth Loop. What is it, and and how did you start it? Yeah, uh, great. Um, like a question, and just for those of you who are joining who are not on the sales side, um, you had my email there at the very beginning. Happy to even talk to y'all later on. This is not really going to be uh, salesy, though. You may. It's just really our journey, and uh, really excited about what we've done, and it's a team sport. I can talk a lot more about that. I just get to be a representative to talk about it. So years ago, our, our company was very, very low, uh, late adopting technology. They couldn't even spell DW or EDW. I mean, they didn't even know what the data warehouse was. And I started a process. And then um, as I came in the company, uh, in the past couple of years, a lot of things have changed. We'd had something on site. We'd made some migrations to Snowflake. We'll talk about that. We'd had enough pain and then enough experience that we knew where we wanted to go and we we were actually very bad i think it was really neat that we could uh we could we had, the way we've done it with our team um what one part of it is we want to keep our data in-house uh we wanted to be able to bring um resources in we wanted to be able to develop an ecosystem we've actually ended up calling it the renaissance data ecosystem or ready world um, because there's so many different components of it. And today we're going to be talking about uh, really some of the uh, most critical pieces of it. Um, so we, got, we get our data in there on Snowflake. We, got, we, we chose Talon. We'll get into the specifics on that, why uh, we migrated them. We were on some other systems before Snowflake and Talon. Uh, those names won't be mentioned here. And then um, we started looking, and Bruce, I just want to say a lot of what you have also helped us with, I know we were using some of your IP and data rocket, which is on Talent, but also you have been a very, and I don't say it's like a very key thought partner with us, with me in growing where we are. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot to be said about that. Um, and then you start taking a look at a uh, third party data set. We'll talk a little bit about Equifax and what that means. Um, and then uh, to tie it all together, for some of our marketing and being able to quickly and reactively drill down to specific audiences we want to reach within the branch, uh, Growth Loop is, paying, uh, is really uh, uh, paving a great road for that, but not only that, being able to measure performance over time. All right, in the center of all this is this philosophy that data is the most important asset we have, um, second most important. First important is our people, second is our data. And so when you look at that, we, how do we steward that? How do we monetize it? And part of it is we get the, we load all of our data in, and then from that loading in the data, we then have to go into uh, what we call our single version of truth, which is where we curate that data. Um, but this is probably a good, a good point to uh, kind of go, go on moving to the other stuff talking about SBOT is, is, is from there, 
How did we get there? And, and Troy, I, I know uh, you invested a lot of time and effort creating that single version of truth so the bank can make the right decisions based on good data. Um, you put a lot of time and energy on that. Well, you know, what have you done to make sure that SBOT keeps up to date and stays up to date? Because data is always changing. Data is always flowing in. You know, what's the magic you've worked to have that SBOT truly be an SBOT? Um, yeah, so you're right. That, that single version of truth is basically where everybody starts in our company when they come in first to data. Now, of course, we have data warehouse and stuff for analytics and stuff that's fantastic about it. But um, that single version of truth is very important to pull all the data sources that we have from our core banking, a lot of stuff that's off core, even systems that are not even related and to pull it in. We had, we had very serious stability issues um in some different environments so when we're looking at a partner we wanted something that was uh, we felt could be long-term stable time in the market that we felt had a good vision about the future of where they're going um and then a very important thing for us that we'll get into is just training we had had such a hard time on some previous systems of really being able to stay up to date and stay innovative but i i might just take this time to bring in um, Robert with uh, Click Talon. Um, we were really happy earlier this uh, year, there was a uh, Talon and Click um, uh, partnered up now, so Talon is a part of Click. But Robert, kind of tell us a little bit about, you know, where, where you see within the Talon world, Click world, and tell, tell the team a little bit about what, what's going on with us and, and y'all and how y'all helped us. Yeah, really, um, it, it's looking at the cost of having bad data in your e ecosystem to be able to make you know, good decisions. It, it really is a garbage in, garbage out scenario. Um, the data quality capabilities within Talon not only enable um, data engineers, but really assets across your organization to take data quality to the next level from um, being able to build data quality, you know, de doing deduplication capabilities within Studio to having some of the self service applications in cloud to do profiling and take action on data and even collaborating between assets. Not to mention, uh, we also have a trust score in our data inventory solution where you can um, harvest data and find potential issues either at rest or at data, you know, in flight. Um, and, and the ability to do this either on-prem or in your VPC to make sure that you're ingesting data in a way that's compliant with said organization is also, I think, very important to click and talent. And, and taking the, yeah. the, those assets and, be, and adding them to the broader click uh, product ecosystem, I think, only makes that story even more compelling and stronger. Yeah, so, you know, Robert, one thing that I kind of maybe say that in what that looks like to me at our level now, one of the things that we benefited from has been some of the paralleling, parallelism that we've had. The previous tool set was really hard to do things in parallel. And our business, as our data has grown in the company and people are using it, we're getting more and more demands to get that data right and ready and early. And we just recently, I, I know when we were scaling out, we actually had our network operations guy say, hey, 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 move some of the stuff, you know, maybe early in the morning now because we're able to, with that parallelism, do things that we've not been able to do before. There's some clustering. Uh, Bruce, you've been around uh, a whole lot listening to us as we've been developing um, our tool set. Uh, maybe some things you want to comment too about, about Calend and 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 how you've seen us using it, and maybe maybe picture you've seen from other other people as well. Yeah, Troy, we we at Passerelle, we've been in the data business for many many years, and we landed on Snowflake and Talon as an ideal combination to best serve our clients. You know, we became Talon's first U.S. bar over six years ago. Uh, SI reseller, same with Snowflake. We became a Snowflake partner over six years ago, and w one reason we selected Talon over all others. They were first to make a highly performant Snowflake connector, two years ahead of anyone else. They were a cloud first company. Uh, they, you know, we've yet to meet a system we can't connect to with Talon. You know, they have a superior connector to say. Hey, hey Bruce, in the, in, the, in the nature of our conversation, I'm gonna interrupt you because this is something exciting, just something I just encountered this yesterday. Our team was talking, we've had to do some things in our previous system, which we're migrating now the last little final bits of some of it off that was that real low level snowflake stuff was the only way we could get things going fast. 
And in our conversation yesterday, they say, you know what, we built this new system, but we did it in talent, and it says faster, it's faster than we're doing it natively. So I hadn't really thought about that until this moment. But yeah, so there was that connectivity to Snowflake that we definitely, I mean, I'm, I've noticed, and just recently the team was talking about that, <laughs> and pointing it out to me, and I'm still learning more and more, which is what I like about it. Um, I'm just interrupt you one more time. Uh, and for those of you, you guys, like most guys don't know me, but this is just the way that, that, that I am and Bruce Hamp. And I figured you were rather genuine in some of the script stuff. So what's also, what's also interesting is the training. I, I just can't overemphasize that right now. Like, even though that there's a lot of changes going on in town and sometimes, you know, it's hard when you develop code to get the most latest training out there. It has been our, our team. I, I've grown over 300% in the past uh, year and a half staff wise, uh, maybe even less than that. It's been, uh, and and being able to just send people to training, you know, just online self-help is just the way we're just, we're just growing. Um, that's really helpful. All right, Bruce, I told Soul Swimmer Thunder, I'm keeping track of the time. I promise, <laughs> Carolyn, but but let's let's talk a little bit more about talent before we have to move on. Thanks, Troy. Yeah, I'll, just to add to that, yeah, the Talent Academy is phenomenal. On-demand training, all our consultants went through it to for their certification and they, our consultants will, will testify. It's phenomenal training to get quickly enabled and what we at Passerelle also did, some clients were looking for some unique accelerators. You know, we, our, we built a product called Data Rocket running on top of talent in Snowflake. You know, for example, we have what's called a dynamic, well-governed, managed ingestion engine. It's a metadata framework that does a dynamic schema on read with change data capture batch ingestion process that helps us pull data even faster in a smart way to reduce the cost of connecting and flowing data in. And Troy, I know we're using that for your FIS connectivity, yeah. correct? Yeah, so yeah, we should talk about that too. That, that, there, there's two things I just realized I probably wanna make sure we, we talk here in this little bit of segment. One is that metadata driven piece of what you're doing with, uh, with the data rocket. Uh, we look at some other vendors out there. There's some problems with it, especially in our environment, the way that FIS is um, and other similar models. And I wanted something that we was that was driven by data in a database to load data into our system, change data capture, um, but that I could also easily report and audit on. And that's why I love that first question that you asked on your on your little survey there earlier, Carolyn, because that's something that's really important to me is to get the people oversight out of my business because it's so transparent. I got to say one thing before we got to move on. I know is Salesforce happened. To us, had an all day meeting yesterday. We're kind of going over what's gone last quarter. Salesforce guy comes up, you know what, we're using the Salesforce native tool set. Uh, hope no one's here Salesforce for the pipeline. And, said, and then we looked at the talent connector and he goes, that talent connector with Salesforce got us more things than we ever could with any way. So we've been really impressed with the connector. We're about to do some other uh, cool things with it. We could spend a lot more than the time we have allocated. But so, Bruce, you know, and Robert, thank you so much for being here and, and uh, being part of this. Thanks, Troy. Yeah, I think the next chapter was once once you assemble that SBOT, you basically landed all your first party data powering Renaissance Bank. You turn towards third party data. Uh, Troy, you know, what was the criteria and reasoning on why Equifax? And what are you hoping to gain from a benefit perspective using the Equifax data and the Equifax relationship? Yeah, so let me just talk about partnership, you know, and I, this cannot, uh, we, our, our initial uh, Snowflake partner, um, you were starting to open my eyes to some of these things I hadn't considered. Uh, one of these was third-party data. And as I've happened and other things, uh, you know, we will, you'll recommend something and behind the scenes, I'm going back saying, well, let me see if Bruce is right. Let me see if I can find something better in it. And uh, we even played this game before uh, where you'll, you'll say, here's your, here's your, and we'll come back and you're right, we'll end up there. And so it's been a great partnership. And with Equifax, there's a lot of things I could say about it. But one thing for me that's just the cost of ownership is, you know, they have, all right, Eric, when I introduce Eric, Eric will tell us how much data they have. But we can narrow it down to specific regions that we need to be in. We're not in all 50 states or all, you know, 186 countries or however many are right now, right? So, so because of that, we can narrow it down to just what we need. And once we sign that contract, I kid you not, I, I sent the paperwork in Wednesday afternoon. Thursday afternoon, I had, the, I had, had all I need to light it up in Snowflake. No pipelining, 
I didn't have to use talent for this. You know, we all use talent all the time, but man, if I can get that load loaded straight up in Snowflake, then that reduces my load. Oh, it was just, it's just crazy. But let me, before I get into any more of my thoughts, pass it off to Eric to talk about what you're seeing with Eric, uh, Equifax, you know, we're looking at, you're using commercial data right now in the process of the consumer data. Uh, tell us, speak yeah, to uh, <clears throat> No, thank you for that, Troy. And actually, I'll, I, I want to start back up at maybe the 50,000 foot level because you have emceed, you have led a, a really important journey for, for the bank. And I think it's a place where our audience can learn from. When, when you think about doing something impactful for an institution, it's, it's about the people and culture. It's about the technology to service a business outcome. And you have led that journey internally. And, and what does that sort of physically mean? What does that look like? It means that you have brought us to your business leaders and the data owners uh, so that we could talk side by side about what you're trying to accomplish and ensure that there's dead on alignment to the things that are important to the bank. And that step is the facilitation of, of success going forward. So then when you talk about the data, um, yeah, the data is really important. Um, we're talking about the commercial data in the moment. Uh, and as you uh, alluded to, we're 180 million business locations across the globe. But Renaissance didn't need that. It needed five states mm -hmm. for now, maybe seven states tomorrow. Who knows? Um, and inside of Snowflake, a, a, just a tremendous technology, we're able to, to target just what you need. And then, as you pointed out, sort of when you need it. And so as our conversations slide over into the world of consumers, households, uh, that same concept is, is right there. Meeting with your leaders, talking about business outcomes, and configuring that data just precisely to what you're looking for. Um, you know, it might also be a good time to let people know because if they don't know me, they might think I'm an extrovert or something. But really, I am a I am a data guy. I've been in there slinging SQL. I, they, I got discovered while I was at the bank and, and that I could do some other things, but I've been hiding out there doing data. So I want to say that if you're on listening to this call, what I think Eric just said is really important for your success. And I hate to just, you know, take up some of this time. We'll make it up on the other end for you, uh, Eric. But it is, if you can just get some of these leaders in front of your other leaders in your business, because you know the technology, if you're a technologist on this, um, you know enough of it to guide them through the fear they have. Uh, and if you're in the sales side, they bring your technology so they can help you with your fear of it. But that, that's right. So now going back to the, this data and the relationship and what y'all have done has been very collaborative. Um, you know, Bruce, you, you've seen people using this data. What, let's talk about maybe some of the benefits you've seen, maybe combining this data with other data. Kind of let's walk us through some of, the, some of that process, too. Yeah, I, from our, our perspective, Troy, we worked hard to build a smart financial services ecosystem revolving around Snowflake. And, and so we teamed up closely with Snowflake's data marketplace team. There was a, a lead in charge of the financial services data sets. And through our discovery, we wanted to lean in on and form a contractual partnership with the top data set providers in the world that could bring the greatest value to banks, to drive deposits, drive lending, understand the wealth, of your own core customers at a household, uh, direct household level to know who to target to drive deposit cash inflow, to know what core members own a house and do they have equity in the house, to know who to promote a home equity line of credit to. Equifax rose to the top over all other large data set providers to help un to basically help banks accomplish their mission, which is you know, drive lending, drive cash inflows and, and, and reduce risk. So we, we formed a partnership with Equifax for that. So, so Eric, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of say something about some of this data and pass over to you some, some other comments too. But, you know, I, I know that we have all, you know, we have the customers that we see in our markets. We're able to, you're able to identify some of our commercial. I mean, the guys who's like a, you know, sole proprietor of his business that gets some CRA stuff, but the actual businesses in that area, you're able to show us, stuff about our customers. Um, you have some proprietary data in there too. I know like some of the stuff that we're looking at is the monthly ongoing uh, 
I don't want to say credit worthy, but you, you have a factor for that. But let's let's talk about some of the things that people might see when they use some of this data or whatever else you might want to let the people on this call know about. You bet. Yeah, if, if I, mine is a simple mind, so I, I like to keep it simple. And, you know, you, you have your client base, your first party data, and there are lots of things that you know about your customers. Um, but there are also things that you're blind to. Um, they might be a small customer of yours, but but frankly, have have a lot more uh, capability or capacity that could be consumer or commercial. So it's sort of uh, illuminating or shining a light into those uh, blind spots. But then you also know and th- and your teams help d- determine best prospects that can be consumer or commercial. And then trying to go find lookalikes, who else is out there? And so that that you know age old effort of of prospecting, uh, and and we like to bring sort of those insights back to you. I, I did want to touch just one quick thing. I know we, we need to move, and you, you touched on CRA, but this has been an important part of our our partnership together, which is mm-hmm. um, the ability, once we understand the business needs, to talk about what data can be used for what purpose. You don't need to be an expert in, in every aspect, but together we can talk about business outcomes, and then we can talk about what limitations there are or aren't on the data and making sure you're staying on the on the right side of, of, of the rules and regulations that right. that we all deal with in in the fi space the troy again hats off to you that you've worked hard to form that s spot add in third-party data to give you a richer view of your customers and prospects you know, we were excited to uh, introduce an additional layer to our ecosystem, our friends at Growth Loop. Uh, you know, Troy, I know your title is EVP, Enterprise Data Management, but I, I think I think of you as a chief monetization office officer. You know, how do we make money uh, uh, off of the data yeah. you've worked hard to make trusted? And, and I think Growth Loop plays a role in that. You know, why don't you share your vision around the art of the possible to monetize that data? No matter where we sit in, in any organization, we need to be thinking about what is the revenue uh, that we are bringing to the bank or the expense reduction, right? It's, it's all the same thing. And so where I sit in the data, is I believe data is currency, data is liquidity, you know, second most important. So, so everything I've got to do is going to be focused on how we use that. Now, there's a lot of ways we can use that data, but one of the ones that becomes interesting when you start putting like Equifax and knowing your customer, we get third party data, first party data, is now how can we take that data together and make it really easily so they don't have to come to IT or to the CDAO, but they can actually themselves figure out based upon whatever these parameters who they need to talk to. So um, I'll, I'll just kind of pass this over to just Catherine Hot talk about growth loop. And then, you know, if there's something else, I might interrupt you, but, but uh, go for it. Tell them about how what we're doing with growth loop and, 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 and how cool y'all are with what you do. Awesome. More than happy to talk about how cool we are. Um, but so uh, let's quickly level set, like what is growth loop? Um, so growth loop is basically a no code interface that sits on top of your, of your data warehouse. Um, and allows anybody, no matter how technical they are, to essentially build super precise audiences and then export them to destination platforms. So we'll start there. That's what it is. Um, and like, why does that matter? And I think why did that resonate um, with Renaissance? So at the risk of getting like a little bit philosophical, I think there are kind of two big bets that we made as a company. Um, and Troy can, you know, validate how Jerry feels like these are and is, you know, in the context of his experience working with us. But number one was kind of the idea of like this rationalization of your marketing technology around the data cloud. So the idea that you've made this massive investment in your data cloud. Um, and historically, the paradigm has then been that a lot of data ends up getting copied to different you know platforms to then be used for activation. Um, and so our premise was that at the end of the day, once you've invested in this data warehouse, like in your Snowflake, um, everything should sit right on top of that. It should be a super thin layer. It should be very plug and play with your tools. So you're really to take, like, able to take advantage of all that security, all that scalability, and maintain the integrity of that data model in one place. So that was number one. Um, again, that kind of philosophical take. And number two is in terms of who's actually able to use that data. 
right? So our second big bet was that it makes sense for the strategic decision makers to actually be able to be hands-on on the data and be quickly activating it to those destinations instead of relying on, you know, an analytics or a data team to make, you know, pretty simple audience polls um, that, you know, those back-to-back -back communications of iterating on audience definitions between those teams just ends up causing a lot of, you know, lag time and prevents marketers from acting um, in as agile a way as you would want. So um, those were our really our two big bets. Um, and Troy, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you feel like that's been playing out in our relationship so far. Yeah, so um, I tell you, one of the values was just initially was y'all knowing, helping us bring back, bring together some of the things that we needed. Once it was there, you know, you hit hit on a concept, and it's, it's, and I think this started with uh, another person you were here from so shortly. It was Snowflake is, hey, bring bring your apps to the data. Don't keep on sending your data out. So we had that challenge because we have vendors who would love to receive all of our data and charge us for it. And then the complexity, because now you're creating a swamp and let's say your CRM or a swamp in your in your, uh, your social media analytics. So we're able to generate those audiences, push it into, let's say, our sales force or into our core system, into social media, all of them. Um, there's these concept of journeys. So you think about like these email, uh, you used to get like email campaigns in the early days. Well, now think of a journey that people come in and hit trigger points. Maybe they're not gonna get something in the social media, or maybe they're gonna get a call. Maybe they're gonna walk into the into the branch and the teller. There's these journeys that we can start putting together with the whole customer experience that are pretty much automated that data. One of the things that happened recently is we're developing is you know, if you haven't been paying attention, mortgage rates are going up, right? And so you know we had a whole group that that was planning. They wanted to go one approach towards how they're gonna reach customers, and they said we just can't do that now based upon things. So they were like, but we need this tool now more than ever because now we can start brainstorming on the fly. You you hit it. The decision makers who know how to do it on the fly, they can generate those audience. So you actually have this. It, it's like the whole liquidity of cash flow. The more the, the more liquid it is, more liquid we can make this knowledge in them. Uh, the easier it is for them to do that. So I think that's really helped. Um, and then for me, a big passion is being able to measure results over time. Uh, by default, I mean, you can adjust it by default, there's a certain amount that gets held back from that treatment of marketing. And so we can see how the actual control group went versus the real results. And sometimes, I mean, guys in marketing don't like to admit it, but sometimes you spend $1,000 to make 10. And then sometimes you spend $10 to make 100. Well, you'd much rather be made, uh, spend $10 to make 100 than $1,000 to make 10. So I like that. Um, and and uh, I think that empowering. Uh, and I guess, you know, Bruce or Catherine, do you have something else you want to add? I know we could spend a lot more time on this, but this has been very poor and actually kind of sits on the top of everything. Like everything almost feeds into it that we've talked about today. It's like, so, I mean, I don't want to, I don't, I don't know how to just describe it, but it's been a great, great asset for us, Bruce or Catherine. Yeah, I think I'll take it back to, I think what you're talking about with the flexibility and agility and like how that plays out in a few different ways. So first of all, it's just being able, again, for a marketer to really easily iterate on criteria. They're getting a live audience size back from their data warehouse. So they're figuring out how many people actually meet this criteria. They're getting breakdowns across key characteristics so they can better understand who is actually in this audience. How does that inform the messaging, the creative? Um, so they're able to iterate you know, in real time. The second piece, like you said, is measurement. So even beyond just kind of those descriptive characteristics and building an audience based on that feedback from the data warehouse, you're also able to optimize those you know, programs post-launch. You can figure out what's working, what's not, what do I lean into, um, what do I need to adjust a bit? Um, and then I think the um, third element of flexibility is um, similar to what I talked about earlier in terms of where does it actually make sense to have your activation platform sitting and your, like, your segmentation platform, it makes a lot of sense to have it on the data warehouse because as Troy was saying, you can now build, build these really dynamic cross-channel journeys that are based on any data point um, in your data warehouse. And really the only way to do that is to make sure you're locating, again, that segmentation and their, that journey building as far upstream as you can. So you then have access to all the downstream platforms so you can build that like super precise, super custom and responsive journeys for customers. So I think that idea of flexibility, and I, I promise I'll stop talking now, um, but it's one that I feel like you see like play out in a few different ways across the spectrum of, you know, our partnership with Renaissance um, and Growth Loop's kind of, you know, philosophy more broadly. And I'll, I'll just add, you know, we pass around. I mean, we wake up every day 
thinking about how can we add more value for our clients? How can we stay one step ahead in, in our thinking and bring something to the table? Know, know what solutions are out there, know what banks are, and credit unions are trying to accomplish and take a position. And we've worked really hard to build this circle of trust, a really smart financial services ecosystem. We call that data rocket that, again, it revolves around Snowflake. And we've gone deep. We can't be friends with everybody. We've got to pick a winner, go deep, be an expert at it to implement it and help customers maximize the value out of the technology. And Growth Loop, again, we're contractual partners with Growth Loop, like we are with Equifax and Talon and Snowflake and other players, because we felt Growth Loop reduces data sprawl. You know, to, to your point, mm -hmm. Catherine, you know, why spend millions of dollars trying to build up uh, S -A -A, uh, I guess you'd call a DVOT, dual version of truth. It's hard enough building yeah. up a single version of truth. Keep it that way. Monetize the heck out of it with a technology like Growth Loop and move on. Why Snowflake? You know, we we at Passerelle, we've used a whole host of technologies and there's a lot of logos out there you can pick for Cloud Lake Cloud Warehouse. We went all in with Snowflake. We felt it was superior above all others. We chose them six years ago. We choose them again today. You know, Troy, uh, you know, how has Snowflake empowered Renaissance Bank to realize your vision, to use data to support the bank's goals? Yeah, so uh, I will say early on in our journey, this is when I was still hiding out and people didn't know uh, um, stuff. And I was just I was just kind of listening into some of the conversations as we were migrating off the existing system. I'll tell you that when they first proposed um, Snowflake and, and Talon, that the board rejected it. And they said, why? And, and they're like, why? Says, because it can't be this good. That that combination can't be this good. Look at what we're doing with these other systems. I kid you not. The project was delayed for nine months. They go back, and we actually the, the only answer we had was to go in and add a bunch of stuff to get it get it closer to what the board expected. So I say that that it was revolutionary compared to what we were experiencing. Um, I've been around data my whole life. I try to get out of it. I try to get out of finance. I just kept on getting sucked back in. So here I am. Uh, but what I can say about it is that they've done a lot of innovative things, even since we've been there, that um, gives me confidence that they're going to continue innovating. And even where we're at now, the, I, I mentioned earlier that we had the ability to come into this um, not being not a whole lot of technical debt because the company had been slow adopting data warehouses. And then when we migrated early systems to Snowflake, we were able to take advantage of some of the neat technologies they were doing, such as role-based masking. So now anytime I get compliance coming in saying, who all can see PII information on this? I'm like, here's the list, and everybody else's mask. And if it don't line, then, then Snowflake's got just, just little things here and there that seem little when you talk about them. But when you put it in an architecture, it means that my the time I have to spend on compliance and taking care of audit things, being able to confirm is so minimal because we were using – Snowflake uh, infrastructure. All right. The other challenge with Snowflake before I hand it off to James and start talking is that, um, you know, most, most banks use one of primarily three super large, you know, large core systems. Snowflake to us is about as big as that because we've invested so much of our energy on there. You know, I've, I've hitched my horse to it. Um, it'd be painful to leave, but we keep our architecture such that if we had to, we could, but there's no way I ever want to because, like, to me, it's a long term vision what they're doing. It's fast. There's a lot of pieces about it. But before I get carried away too much more, because obviously I've gotten excited. Maybe I didn't have enough breakfast this morning. But James, why don't you talk a little bit about Snowflake, some of the things that you're seeing. You're in the banking sector. And we'll bounce it back to Bruce. And then uh, the time, if there's any time remaining, I will mention a couple of other things I'm really excited about that y'all are doing, uh, doing now. Thank you, Troy. And I appreciate it. Um, it's a difficult task to be left to go last after this crowd, but I'm thrilled to be doing it. And <laughs> I think it shows the... It's a contextualization, contextualization of the collaboration amongst teams to, to come to a common outcome. So just very quickly, um, what is Snowflake very fast? It's a, it's a secure and scalable data platform and ecosystem of content really driven to solve uh, business challenges and really empower data-driven decision-making. Um, 
And really the way we see Snowflake internally is we just are an operating system to deliver all of the fantastic data and intellectual property of both Renaissance banks of the world, um, the growth loops, the Equifax and the talents, right? And if you really heard, and just to contextualize what we've heard over the last you know, 20 minutes or so, we're, Snowflake gets the honored pleasure to simplify access to high quality data through talent, um, really with focused domain specific content of relevance from Equifax, and then really to drive a business outcome for that hyper-personalized client outreach through Growth Loop, right? And so I think, Troy, it's just sort of a testament to your vision. And I think um, given the macro backdrop today, right, we're in a serious time of transition with a dramatic rate of change, right? So the amount of ink possible outcomes today is just so significant that people need to have that high quality data to really inform decisions in a quality manner. So you know, let's let's take a step back into the financial services industry. It's predicated on physical data movement. And I think some of the magic that maybe your board was resident about originally, it's just it's a simple concept of let's just stop moving the data, right? Let's bring the work to the data, simplify access to with those role-based access controls for the high quality, secure governed data state to make those best business decisions. And, I, and as I get to talk across banks, payment companies, capital markets firms, what are their key business priorities? It's really risk reduction client and revenue retention, but all underpinning this is profitability, right? Because as Troy aptly mentioned, we had the fastest increase in interest rates in four decades, right? So the cost of capital is higher. What am I doing from a technological event to connect to clients while protecting either the bank and, and bring myself that much closer to my clients to protect my revenue streams? And I think um, this unification of uh, simplification of tech architecture and administrative effort is enabling that possibility of the profitability outcomes that we think, not just from a tech simplification standpoint, but as we do jump into, as we have to talk about the words of Gen AI, that expectation from board levels and investors that really is thinking about profitability and, pro, um, and, and productivity amongst our teams. So it's a pleasure to be here and I'll kick it back to you, Bruce and Troy. So I've seen a lot of technologies in my 40 year career. I've seen nothing like Snowflake, uh, it, it, you know, the, Day one, when we became a Snowflake partner, all our consultants that were used to using a different technology, SQL Server and Oracle and other platforms, it's Troy, it's like you said, it, they, they almost didn't believe it. You know, the experience in using Snowflake is like, this can't be true. I mean, we don't have to do, you know, active, 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 passive, log shipping, mirroring and all the management. I, there's none of that. You're yeah. using cloud as a service and yeah. the platform so flexible, easy scale up, auto scale out. Time travel, you know, what did the data look like, you know, 43 days, 10 hours and two seconds ago? I mean, the capability yeah. Snowflake has was five years ahead, six years ago. And I remain I, I, I remain confident they're still years ahead of anyone else in the market. And, and we're, we're blessed to have chosen Snowflake uh, and made the right choice six years ago. We make the same choice today. And by the and sorry, Jay, I can tell you want to say something. Yeah, sorry. So just really quick on that, and I think this is one thing I one thing you said, and by the way, thank you for the kind words, Bruce, but I also think something that Troy mentioned, it's it's these um the the banking core data that sits with inside the walls of many firms, right? How do you unlock that value to bring together to what Catherine's really talking about of connecting to your clients? And we have connectors to Salesforce, but we also can help you get access to the banking core data who are also clients of Snowflake to then hopefully bring a much faster time to value around that client experience, understand your client footprint. And even if it's one of those pieces now post SVB, the deposit stickiness, right? How are you measuring the liquidity of your underlying business um, to really reduce risk of your firm and scale out and connect to your clients while protecting the bank? I think this is where I think that some of the tidbits that have been said here, just to unify it again, simplifying access to that really core banking data to then have the client outcome that you want to have. And I think this is where we're thrilled to be part of that connective tissue. All right, this is, this has been great. I'm gonna I, I, we could talk about all these for a long time. That's actually why, honestly, uh, for those of you who are in the industry, you have questions. That's why you're gonna have my email and other people here. If you want to talk to them, please talk to them. And if you want to talk about their stuff specifically, but have you talked to Vision? But from there, I want to kind of pass it back to Carolyn for you know who's organized all this for all of us to share and and uh, hopefully be a service to those of you who are on this call. about how you're approaching um, Gen AI at Renaissance, Troy. 
and um, and then maybe we can get everyone to weigh in on how how banks and and credit unions can be looking at Gen AI and what their approach should be with that. Yeah, I'll tell you where we are is we are carefully looking at it. Um, you know, I think we'll uh, talk to some of the partners here to say how they're using it. Uh, there are some concerns about data, you know, leaking out of our system. Just, you know, Google, Samsung, and AI, you'll see some stuff that happened not too long ago. And, and also to the value compared to other things that we might be able to just buy out of the box. So we're doing that analysis. Uh, are putting some R&D there. Um, and uh, there's one more thing I was about to say, but I can't remember, so I might interrupt someone else in the end, but maybe I'll pass it around. I'll just pick that uh, maybe maybe James or one of you guys to go. How, how are you guys looking at AI in your world? Oh, uh, this is what I was going to say. It's neat. Snowflake has come up with something recently that we like that's going to allow us perhaps to use AI, our own stuff, within their own world and keep data from leaking out. That's a huge thing. So we're going to explore that. And, and Troy, thank you for the setup. I'll try to keep this very brief. This is obviously a topic that we'd love to talk about at at, at nauseum, but really, you can't really have an AI strategy without a, a secure, governed, foundational data strategy. And I think many times we see the expectation of this profitability and pro, you know productivity miracle, but we also forget what is the one thing we don't want to have happen. We have a hundred things we want to do. What's the one thing that Troy just mentioned we don't want to have happened? You don't want to have data and IP exfiltration, right? So how do we then, taking that as the governing North Star, then work backwards? Um, so truthfully, this is where we're sending together to help people keep the data at, at rest um, in a secure governed data state and then bring the modeling to it with choice of models, whether it's open source uh, models such as a Llama 2, or if it's a proprietary model that you develop on your own, you can use containerized services or we're embedding services we call Snowflake Cortex that were announced last week that'll be embedded within native Snowflake to be called as a function within the platform on that secure governed data to then solve um, your underlying business problem without that risk of data you know, exfiltration and IP theft. What about others on the panel? Uh, tell us about AI in your world. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at it in, in the Equifax world. And and certainly for financial institutions, large and small, and and regardless of vertical, there's lots that AI can be doing in, in the moment, right? Uh, from your customer service and your knowledge, your knowledge graph and other, other tools that help enable efficient uh, businesses. I'll take an angle for Equifax for the moment. Um, so one of the things that we do, of course, is we bring models and scores uh, into credit decisioning, consumer or commercial. And frankly, the, the net of signals keeps broadening from not just traditional uh, lending activity and payment activity, but also payment of rents and payment of utility bills and, and what have you. So that net is wide. Um, and AI is, and Gen AI is an incredible tool to help create even more predictive models. Um, but importantly, in that process, a couple things haven't changed. Um, we all still hold a responsibility, Equifax hold a responsibility to ensure that there's no disparate impact in the modeling. Uh, Equifax has a responsibility that we help you with to ensure that there's um, if there's adverse action, someone isn't eligible for the best offer, that there's transparency as to, um, you know, what in, in that individual's background uh, caused that adverse action. Um, and so Equifax has some IP ar ar around explainable AI that's really important. So th I think the takeaway here is uh, AI can be used a lot of different places and ways as you look at sophisticated modeling. There's tools and technology that uh, Snowflake has that help support that. When we bring our models, um, we all, we carry forward those obligations of transparency, and we'll we'll, we'll bring those to you. You know, at, pa at Passerell, I, I'm excited about how generative AI could really drive the return on investment in scale. You know, we've been you know, we, we use the Garda leaders for visual analytics, dashboards, you know, uh, enable employees across a bank or credit union to get insights, make fact-based fact decisions. 
that's all well and fine. But if you look at most institutions, there's so many, only so many people that know how to build a dashboard and only so many dashboards that get built. What I think generative AI is going to bring to the table, every employee knows how to ask a question. Every employee has something on their mind, some question they'd like to just ask of the data and have a dashboard, have a report just be automatically built for him or her. That's the promise of Gen AI to drive democratization of data out to every employee at an institution versus some number less than that. Uh, uh, the bottleneck being the effort it takes to create a dashboard, create a report to then share out. That all goes away with Gen AI. Yeah, and I'll um, go off of that as well. So I think at Growth Loop, when we think about Gen AI and AI in general, there's like these three categories. Um, where we see, you know, it applying to our software. So number one is, I think what Bruce is referring to, which is really enablement. So it's like, how are you better enabling, again, those strategic decision makers to better access, understand, and activate the data? Um, because right now, obviously, we are, again, like a thin layer that sits on top of the data inter or on top of the data warehouse. Um, there's still some level of, you know, understanding of the data that has to go into actually activating it for a marketer to segment that data. Um, and I think the goal is, and this is a feature that we're actually, we just rolled out, um, is how can we allow a marketer to just, you know, type out in natural language, the kind of audience they want and have that just generated, you know, into a SQL query based on the underlying data, instead of them having to comb through filters and figuring out, figure out like exactly which one seems to best match their use case. Um, so enablement, right. In terms of just better enabling folks, um, to build those audiences really easily and intuitively, and the other two buckets that we also think about, it's going to be insights driven targeting. This is a bit more to what Eric um, was chatting through, which is how are we, you know, enabling marketers to essentially activate like propensity models, um, propensity models, affinity models, um, risk of churn, you know, lifetime value predictions, et cetera, um, without having, actually having to force a data team to build those. Um, so that's number two is that insights driven targeting. Um, and then the third piece is going to be actually the generative AI content. Um, so we have a partnership with a cool company called Typeface that actually allows you to, um, you know, actually generate the content in the creative that ends up removing a bottleneck we sometimes see folks run into, which is that you can now build audiences super quickly, activate them super quickly, but your creative and your content like doesn't necessarily run at the same speed. Um, and so I think those are really those three buckets again. So enablement, um, then that more insights driven targeting, and then the generative content as well. Yeah, maybe I can jump in too. Thank you, Catherine. Um, uh, when we talk about data, I mean, you really want to go back to the basics. I know I've mentioned this before, but you really want to make sure that the data going into these models that's being processed is at the highest quality possible. <clears throat> I think that's where talent really excels from that perspective, being able to create ecosystems that monitor your data assets. Like uh, Troy put it, the data, your data ecosystem, make sure you know where the data is coming from, make sure you can identify issues and you can take action on that data as quickly as possible before getting it into those models um, and maybe having issues with that. There's been blunders with several companies over the years as far as compliance or you know revenue impact or reputation. So data quality, I think, is a, a foundational thing when you get into AI and generative AI. Um, from a click standpoint, they're at the forefront of leveraging generative AI to be able to ask a lot of questions and do that, that type of analytics. They've also been a player um, in AI via AutoML for a long time as well from that asset. Great. So um, if anyone has any question, any more questions, um, now is the time. Otherwise, we'll do one more question and then we'll do a quick wrap. I will announce the winner of the food bank um, um, drive, I guess. And um, so at the start of this call, we had a poll that was things that were people were looking ahead um, for and um, for 2024. And the winner was automation followed by uh, um, leveraging Gen AI and innovation in the cloud. So I'll just really quickly, 30 second answer from all of our panelists. What data trend are you most looking forward to um, as you look ahead to 2024? And I'll start with you, Bruce. I think generative AI is uh, number one. Uh, the promise it it can bring to the table is truly unlocking the value of the data. You know, knocking the uh, knocking it out of the park. And I think 2024 is a year that's going to happen. 
for me, we've done a lot of things. So I've got, I'm focusing a lot on making sure that the people who are like overseeing me can see it quickly. So it doesn't slow me down on fulfilling these things that people want me to do, researching Gen AI and monetizing the data. So some of the things that I'm taking some time on right now is to just some of these basic, kind of like, you know, gentlemen, this is a football type basic. Like here, you know, let's make sure we get the basics done so we actually can use our creative energy on these things that are coming next year. Um, Eric? Yeah, I, um, I'm going to echo back some things we've talked about. You know, Snowflake is an amazing technology. And that phrase that we that was used here, um, don't take your data to the apps, bring your apps to the to the to the data. It um, that has material implications for how businesses run and how quickly things can happen. Um, so that that's that's going to be a game changer. Continue to be a game changer in 2024. Robert. Yeah, and I, I know I might be drinking the Kool Aid a bit, but I'm really excited to see where Talend and Click are going from a roadmap and integration standpoint. I think it's going to be a very compelling offering next year. Uh, Catherine? Um, I think Gen AI is definitely the most fun one to talk about, but <laughs> uh, one buzzword that actually hasn't come up so far, um, but I, Eric wasn't really alluding, into, alluding to it, is the idea of like composability. Um, so we're seeing a major movement away from having, you know, these like, let's call them like mega solution customer data platforms and making your solutions more modular and plug and play in the context of plugging into the data warehouse like Snowflake. Um, and I think that's when I'm very excited to see how that continues to develop and, you know, helps, I think, all companies kind of continue to continue to invest in that data integrity um, and that single source of truth while still getting all the benefits of those um, composable platforms. And James? All right. Again, last but definitely least. Um, <laughs> so. I want to go back to one word that Eric mentioned that I think is crucial. So we know automation, you said it was number one, right? So to enable automation, especially in the financial services industry, which is highly regulated, the word is explainability, right? The ability to observe, go back, audit that information, and then LLMs could be magic, 100%. But someone getting turned down for a loan and saying the LLM turned it down without the understanding, the observability, and explainability of the outcome isn't possible. So I think... This is why I'm excited about this panel, because all of the data quality that's been discussed, the quality of the domain expertise of the content, and then the activation of it is exactly why we're collaborating in this type of manner with the foundation to understand that financial institutions have to be able to explain each and every step of the process and the outcome, not just to their under, to maintain trust of clients, but also to maintain trust of regulators. So I think um, that's, that's my view on this. And I think automation can and will happen. Um, it may not happen in the speed at which people believe it has, but at the end of the day, this is where I think we're accelerating very quickly to, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Troy, do you have any parting words you can leave with us as far as what your secret sauce is, how, how you have uh, managed your data estate uh, um, modernization and um, words of wisdom? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot, a lot of it was referred to throughout this conversation, but I think you need to think of yourself as a secret sauce in your company. That greatest asset the company has is you, the culture you create around you. There's a lot of stuff on this call that you pick up from a technology standpoint, but I'd pay attention to all the stuff that was said here that was not technology-based because that's what's going to make a difference on, on your competitiveness to the people in your marketplace. So that, that's my secret sauce, I think. It's going to be you. And to our panelists and everybody have a fantastic Wednesday afternoon.